This is the business culture of agriculture. My name is Andy Junkin, and I'm the president of Agriculture Strategy. And, uh, and with me today, I have uh, Jim Solden, who's with the Canadian Farm Business Institute. Uh, I should, I, the Canadian Family Business Institute. He's from uh, Fraser Valley in BC. And uh, Jim, why don't you tell us a bit about your background before we uh, learn more about your business and your perspectives? So. Thanks, Andy. I um, I grew up on a farm in East Central Alberta, um, a farm that's been in the family now as of now 115 years. I've seen every valley and hilltop experience, and probably it was it was those experiences that have, have led me to do what I do today. At a very early age, I saw my dad and my and his dad farm together. I heard the words. I saw my mama cry, and I said, "It should not be this way." Then. Later on, I experienced working with my dad myself and my brothers with my dad and again said, this is not right. This doesn't have to be this way. And then I went on to school and I soon formulated in my mind that success or demise of a family business does not rest with the amount of milk in the tank or grain in the bin or the amount of shoes you produce. It rests rather with a team of people and their ability to live and work together in harmony, to live together effectively to have effective communication together. And and what problem do you actually see with traditional succession planning? And by the way, folks, I should just uh, add just before we get into this, uh, Jim and, and I had some technical difficulties. And so Jim is joining us by speakerphone. We usually have um, our, our, our speakers on, on the screen as well, uh, so you don't have to look at my ugly face. But uh, we had a, f a few de technical difficulties. So Jim is joining us today from Fraser Valley of BC over the speakerphone. And Jim, what uh, problems do you see with traditional farm succession planning? Well, one big part, this whole area is often looked at as a transaction, which results in a quick, quickly scripted, uh, logistically flawless tax strategy. Now, don't get me wrong. We need to be aware of tax implications and, and but that's the technical part. We must first focus on the planning part and of which tax considerations are looked at, but the tax must not dry, direct the process. This whole area is not a transaction. We need to look at it first as a transition. Succession should only be talked about by the two generations and that being senior generation says, we would like to farm with our kids. We'd like to be in business with our kids. And then, um, that's quickly followed by a junior generation that said, "Yeah, I'd like to be. In, I'd like to farm with my dad." Uh, that's what needs. That's how it needs to go. We must not put the technical part before the planning part. The accountant and the lawyers and the do not have the answers for the family. That's why I work so hard to put families together so they can they can mold and create the, the thing. Picture in your hand like you're holding a cup. Or, a, or, or, a, or a, some kind of a tool, and you present this to the accountant and the lawyer and said, this is what we want ourselves to look like when we, when we drop all the agreements. It, it ought not be the other way around, where the accountant and the lawyer looks at five or six particular strategies, I think this one will work for you. No, 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 no. It's the, 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 the look of it, the thing they want to create, they need to do that themselves. And I think putting the, talk about the transfer of assets before we start to talk about the transition of management. I mean, really, that's putting the cart before the horse. I couldn't I agree with you more. Um, Correct. Uh, you developed a program over the last 25 years. Um, explain explain the, the family furrow uh, training program. Well, I've always kind of referred back to my farming experience. You have to work things through. You have to take things apart before you really know what's going on wrong in it. And I used to think of, Back in our farm, we'd dump truckloads of manure all over the field, and there'd be a truckload of manure in the yard, and people would well, I think there's a dead calf in there, or there's a bale of straw, and we, we don't know. So we take a fork at a time, and we flick it, and we take it apart, and we find out what's going on. So that's in the same way that I do with my program. I run the family through quite a, quite a cultivation process. I want to know what's going on. I'll interview the individual couples. I'll then give them a massive questionnaire that after they fill that out, I get a real understanding of what's going on. I summarize the questionnaire. I go through it with the family, each question, 
and the answers from everybody, and they start to say, aha, I, I never knew that. Oh, well, that's interesting. We need to talk more about that. And then from there, we start to work on and discuss developing codes of conduct, what we value in terms of family, and in terms of business. We document all this. We are building an operative and maintenance manual for the family business team. We talk about what we hold important in terms of family and business. We talk about policies and procedures and the resulting procedures. We talk about the needs of the junior and the senior generation, off-site siblings as well. We spend a fair bit of time on, on accountability and consequence. That it can't be that we, they, they, they commit to a process, they commit to a style of governance, if you may say, in their family, that if you do something, there will be a consequence, either positive or negative. And we hold people to that. We talk about goals. They put down their thoughts for short, intermediate, long term. Um, we discuss and document significantly the history of that family farm business up until that point in time. We draw a timeline at that point in time when the program starts, a balance sheet of the farm. Every physical, financial, emotional asset is documented. And the reason for that being, as they go with a different understanding toward one another, they will see the growth. So we need to know where we started from to be able to gauge, yes, this is working, or no, we need to correct that or, correct or change that. We go on and talk about a significant part of, on, on managing conflict, which is it's not a matter of if there will be a conflict, it's just a matter of when. Uh, we talk about holding and running effective meetings, which is an incredibly important tool. You need to come together regularly to discuss and share information, to make decisions, but also to get to know one another, to get to know one's concerns, one's hopes, expectations, assumptions, priorities, beliefs, fears, and values. That can only come when we're sitting eyeball to eyeball, kneecap to kneecap, gut to gut, and talking about the various issues that evolve around the farm. Um, we talk about communication a fair bit. One of the, one of the, the, the biggest thing that leads to a, a, a wreck in a family business is poor communication. And poor communication a thousand times over, I have to say that. I'd agree, 220. Lack of communication, lack of effective communication. Could agree more. And the, uh, what do you think a lot of uh, people going into succession planning, what they think that their biggest problems are going to be, and then what are the, uh, the most common problems that they actually realize after the fact? Well, what can I say? Um, one of the things is that the senior generation has not really um, understood that the younger generation is not going to be exactly like them. Yeah. The younger generation um, has their own ideas and thoughts. Uh, another point is the senior generation does not know when to put on the, the boss hat and put on the father hat. There's, there's a confusion on that. When you're working together with your son, yeah. you've got to treat him you know, first like an employee, and he's got to, he's got to respect that. Um, there is uh, the whole whole conflict over, well, someday this will be yours. Well, what does that someday look like? Is it 100 years from now? Is it 10 years from now? We've got people that are 40 and 50 years old, got kids, adult kids of their own, and they're still working for a wage in the family business. No, then they may be not capable of doing any more, but most times it's not. So there's a lot of misunderstandings of what the senior generation will do and, and what they actually do and what, how the junior generation will, will interact and react to the senior generation's commands and desires and wishes. That's why long before you, you get into things, you, you plan it out, you lay it out when it comes to roles and responsibility. Let's do it for a year this way, okay, they understand. When it comes to decision making, Who's going to make the decision? What level of decision will you, the senior generation, do? Will you, junior generation? Do? How will we handle compensation? How much we get paid? How will we handle um, ownership? These things are talked about. Then you won't have that where all of a sudden there's a there's a dust up and a blow up because we've already addressed it. All the things that are going to happen, we can address them. 
It's like it's like making a map from here to to Houston, Texas. We know which mountain range we got to go over. We know where we're going to have difficulty with snow in a particular time of the year. We can plan ahead. Planning, communicating, planning, and letting go of the control. And what are the biggest common problems that you see with uh, daughter-in-laws or son-in-laws entering the family business? That's the first part of the question. I guess the second, the second part of the question should be, what are three recommendations you'd have uh, for a, a family uh, to consider when a new daughter-in-law is joining the family business? Well, one, one of the, there's a bunch of problems, or could be common problems or issues with the in-law, daughter, or son-in-law entering a family business is, is fitting in. Being able to contribute without being thought of as a meddling or wanting to scoop the farm. Yeah. Um, uh, another issue of being looked down upon if they just want to raise kids and look after the kids in the home, and they don't want to feed calves or drive the tractor. They don't want to feel that they're, they're really out of sync. So some of the recommendations that I give to families, and we talk about it, and they agree very, very heartily. Number one, love them so hard that they would rather die than leave your business. Yes. Another one, seek their input. Ask them, how do you see this? And when they say, well, I'm just from the city. No, 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 I know you're from the city, but look at this and tell me what you think, because they, they all have a level of wisdom on their shoulders. Seek that out. Uh, let them contribute. Find something that, that they could do. Uh, maybe they don't want to do anything because they, they feel insecure. They feel they won't do it right. Tell me, no problem. You can't do this wrong. You know, you can take a bucket of milk to the calves or whatever. Come once a week. We want you to start to understand what's going on in our business. Uh, don't call them a daughter-in-law or son-in-law. Call them a new son or a new daughter. And I think, I think you and I uh, were speaking just before the show about the importance of loving them unconditionally and uh you know instead of judging them and, and seeing what's wrong with the new in-law is is you, you you believe that they should be loved unconditionally is that true or you want to elaborate on that a little bit further but i think that's really critical you love them unconditionally there are some things that are close to the heart of people and um it ought not be a deal, a deal breaker if they decide to um, buy the odd pair of jeans at the designer shop. We shouldn't uh, chastise them for that. Um, there are some things that matter and some things that are not worth to get into conflict over. Yeah. When, when generations come together, there are some absolute uh, necessities based on business principles, but there are some things that need to stay private with the with the new family coming on stream and we need to respect them for that and, and we do that by by loving them regardless if they if they do something for example oftentimes the younger generation will move into the move into the old yes. house for mom and dad work don't don't uh, roll your eyeballs because the daughter-in-law decided to repaint the kitchen so for yeah. five or six hundred bucks are you going to go to war for that what do you want what, what do we want in family we want them to be happy yeah. So if they're going to put a gallon of paint, let them be happy. Don't deny the people to be happy. Absolutely. And, and, and let's talk a little bit further about the prenuptial agreements. What do you think of them? Um, you know, are you for them or against them? Or what, what's your perspective on prenuptial agreements? Well, there's a time and a place for them, I guess. A lot of times they come about when somebody's been burnt in the past. Yeah. And they might have well, they might have well deserved the burning. But what I say they're only good if they're talked about by all the members involved and all the ones whom will be affected by should a demise occur can contribute and have their concerns and hopes and wishes and values addressed and incorporated into the agreement then it's good otherwise it's it's just a, a smorgasbord set before the courts yeah and uh just to wrap up, you, you recently uh, presented at the Canadian Agriculture Farm Advisors Conference, and you made a presentation to all the bankers, all the lawyers, all the chartered accountants um, that are involved in succession planning in the, in the uh, farm succession industry. Um, do you want to explain what you explained to them and uh, how you think that there's a philosophical issues uh, within our industry today beyond what we spoke of at the beginning of the, of the show? Well, I might have re might repeat a little 
little sure, bit. Sure, you might. Time. Yeah. When we, when we, when I talked to the other advisors, I wanted to make it explicitly clear to them that when we hear, or when we are loaded upon us, if we're a lawyer or an accountant or a, or a, or a banker coming to a farm, we hear of, a, of the dust up or the relationship issues, we must not blow it off and trivialize it. Yeah. The whole area of the people part has been so marginalized and so looked at so shallowly that it hasn't got the attention and the and given the seriousness that it ought to have. I, I'll give you a picture of any family business that's got a little bit of a dust up or a big dust up is like a woman in labor you come across on the sidewalk. You don't know if she's in her fifth month or third month or ninth month. A doctor could figure it out pretty quick, eh? Yeah. Asking the right question or just just taking a look. But if you're unskilled and you and you really don't understand family dynamics, you have no business giving uh, your take on what to do. You have no business making a snide comment like, oh well, your son, I know he's been in a bad mood for 10 years, he'll get over it. Do not trivialize it, leave it alone and turn it over to the people that have the skill and ability to handle it. Start to teach your clients, the farmers, that's, that's not a small issue, that's not a soft issue, that's a very important issue. That, you're talking about the engine of the business and there's a little grinding inside, you gotta shut the engine off and you gotta know how to work at it, you gotta know how to look at it. Yeah. So that's what I try to impart to them. Don't trivialize, don't do something that you haven't got any skill in. Leave it to people that have the skill and the ability to do that. And, and I think that's pretty key. Like, I don't know how many times you had to take farms off of farms. Uh, I've, I've, I've lost, uh, lost fingers. Uh, you know, I have taken firearms off of farms more times than I've got fingers um, oh. because things are just that tough. Um, yeah. I understand that you have a very similar background in, in being called in when, you know, um, the farm is about to go up for auction. And uh, give me one example of how you've been able to turn around a farm. You know, there's a lot of farms that they, when um, somebody calls me out to the farm and you're in the same situation, uh, there's a lot of farms, uh, family members think, oh, this is, you know, well past that point. Give me an example of a situation where, you know, the farm was about, uh, the, uh, the father or mother was about to call the auctioneer and sell the whole place. And, um, and, uh, and, and you were able to, to turn the situation around or uh, give us an example of a dire situation. That's a good news story today. Well, sometimes, you know, only the good Lord can, yeah. can heal things, but sometimes you, you at least stop the people from truly hurting one another. Yeah. Uh, I stopped the people from going to court, stop the people from killing one, literally killing one yeah. another. Uh, by having them inter by, by interceding and say, look, this is no good this way. Let's start to discuss this piece by piece. Let's take one point at a time and start to bring understanding. And with the flip chart and an ink pencil, you can start to draw a picture yeah. where they say, whoa, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think that you felt that way. Through my questionnaire, it answers a lot of questions where farmers go, Man, I, I didn't realize that. And I'm thinking to myself, you've been here to get 10 years together, 20 years together. You don't know what he's thinking. You don't know that's been a, a real sore point with him. But there's things that go off people's backs like water off a duck's back. So it's in the discussion. Where, and then they may not, like they may not stay together, but at least there's some civility left. Yeah, and I think it's all about getting the family together at Christmas, uh, regardless of whether they're business partners or not. Uh, keeping everybody together as a family and it comes first before before anything else um, Absolutely. with with uh, um, with us today is uh, Jim Solden he's with the Canadian Farm Business Institute um, his phone number is a six four six zero four seven nine four seven one eight six and you're from uh, Jim you're from the Fraser Valley in British Columbia but you do a lot of consulting work in Alberta and across Western, across Canada, do you not? Well, I, I've been in Alberta and Saskatchewan. Uh, I've, I've talked to people in Eastern Canada by telephone. So, sure. Um, 
Yeah, I um, I contribute to a local uh, the BC Holstein news, Dairy Holstein news uh, that goes across Canada. Sure. I don't wave a flag. I've been kind of rather quiet, and some things spread by word of mouth. Sure. Um, I uh, I have a I have a a great desire to stop the the hurtfulness that can happen in family business teams. Yeah, that they can live lives of of true success. And I've I've got a formula. I ask people, well, how would you define success in the family farm business? And I have a bunch of factors. It's it's multiplication multiplication formula. You have to have a profit, and you have to have harmony. Those are two major ones. Yeah. So profit times harmony will give you success. You ought to have fun, which is another factor. You ought, ought to be a, contribute to your family and to the local community. So there's a bunch of factors, and then a strong faith what that might be for you. You put those together in, a, in an equation with a multiplication sign between each one of them. If there's a zero in any one of them, you've got a zero in the end. Yeah. The two main ones. You've got to make a profit. You've got to pay the bills. And the other one, there's got to be harmony. And with harmony, all the other fruit grows from that. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. This has been Jim Solden. Jim, what's your website and what's your contact information? My website is, um, or email is Solden, S-O-L-D-A-N-F-F, -F, Frank Frank, at telus, T-E-L-U-S dot net. And my phone number is 604 794-7186 in the Fraser Valley, Chilliwack, British Columbia, Canada. Fantastic. Uh, Jim has, uh, was unfortunately not able to join us tonight by, uh, by video, but I'm glad that we've been able to have him over speakerphone. And uh, I encourage anybody who has any questions uh, to give him a call. Um, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be on tomorrow night. Uh, we're going to be speaking. Uh, we're going to be talking to Edgar, uh, Edgar, Edgar, uh, um um, Dave Sullivan, and uh, who's from Ag Agris Capital, and he's going to be speaking uh, tomorrow night, talking about how uh, crop insurance can be used to uh, improve um, the succession strategy of a family farm. My name is Andy Junk, and this has been the Business Culture of Agriculture. Uh, you can call me anytime at 800-474-2057. Um, you take care, and God bless.